Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for finding time and joining today's webinar. While waiting for other participants, I would like to encourage everyone to please test your audio and video in order to prevent technical issues during the webinar. Please note also the guidelines of this webinar as splashed in the screen. Our webinar guidelines for today are test audio and video upon entry. Our audio and video will only be open between 2.30 in the afternoon until 2.55. Participants will be on mute and video off when presenters begin the webinar at 3 p.m. You may type in your questions, comments, or suggestions in the chat window anytime. We will respond during the open forum or question and answer portion. Everyone encouraged to answer the evalu evaluation poll questions at the end of the webinar. Copies of the PowerPoint presentation, e-certificate, and any documents that are referred to on this webinar will be sent to participants after the webinar. If you have any technical issues or questions using the Zoom software, please visit Zoom Help Center. And for further inquiries, kindly email Ms. Riza Estadola at wetlandsph at gmail.com.
Again, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, and I hope everyone is doing well despite the world health crisis we are facing now. I am Shin Rose Kabakaba, a program assistant of Wetlands International Philippines Program, and I am your host for today. May I request you to please stay until the end of the webinar because I will give you details on how you can get your e-certificates after the open forum. So while we are still waiting for other participants, allow me to give you a brief background of today's activity. This webinar is organized by the Wetlands International Philippines Program to commemorate the celebration of World Environment Day, which is celebra celebrated on every 5th of June. The theme for 2020 is Time for Nature. The World Environment Day would like to remind us that all food we eat, air we breathe, water we drink, and climate that makes our planet habitable all come from nature. Sending us a message to care for ourselves, we must care for nature. We believe that it's indeed time for us to hear the voices and cries of our nature from natural disasters, climate change, and anthropogenic exploitations. Thus, we are hosting a webinar that offers integrated solutions to coastal zone development using the power of nature, which provides a way to plan, design, and operate infrastructure where natural elements such as fauna and flora, wind and tides are considered, creating more benefits for nature, people, and the economy. It is an approach called building with nature. The title of today's webinar is, How Can We Apply Building with Nature in the Philippines? And on behalf of the organizing team, I would like to welcome you all for this webinar. To give us knowledge and insights of building with nature, we will have three speakers for today, all who come from Wetlands International. But before we welcome our first speaker, there will be a slight changes in the schedule. We will have the question and answer after the talk of the first speaker due to his prior engagement. And after his talk, it will be followed by the talks of the second and third speakers. To delay no more, our first speaker is Mr. Peter Van Eyck. He will give us a talk on building with nature towards sustainable engineering practice. Mr. Peter holds a Master of Science degree from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, specializing in tropical ecology and international nature conservation. He leads the program on deltas and coasts of Wetlands International Global Office. Overseeing implementation of the strategy, coordinating program development, and supporting implementation of projects on the ground. It involves projects on biodiversity conservation, integrated coastal zone management, urban master planning, and coastal risk reduction and adaptation. He was previously involved in freshwater and peatlands programs, supporting the development of conservation finance strategies and incentive mechanisms for community-based natural resources management. Mr. Peter is a member of the EcoShape Consortium closely working with the engineering and marine contracting sectors, promoting more sustainable approaches to coastal infrastructure development in line with the Building with Nature philosophy. And now, without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Peter Van Eyck. Thanks a lot, uh, Sheen, and thank you everyone for having me. It's very exciting to see that so many in the Philippines have joined this session and uh, yeah, have shown a keen interest to explore the topic uh, of building with nature, uh, a new approach to engineering, uh, which uh, well is, is really coming up in different parts of the world. 
And I'm very excited to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, uh, please. Then we can start the presentation. And I'm just checking because I see that part of the screen is covered. Oh yeah, now the, the view is clear. Thank you. So I think it's clear that, yeah, we need infrastructure. It keeps us safe. Infrastructure uh, helps us to develop our economies, to transport ourselves to different parts of the world. But I think it's uh, an understatement to say that infrastructure also comes across with challenges. Next slide, please. I think many people will be aware that in many cases, infrastructures that are applied might have unintended uh, side effects. And then you can see that on the left side of the screen, you can build a very nice housing estate in a floodplain wetland. But if in that floodplain, you then create all kinds of landfills, the regulating role of the floodplain is disturbed and you might cause flooding problems elsewhere. And likewise, you can build a beautiful coastal pier along your beach, but there's many examples of where such coastal infrastructure causes severe erosion problems hundreds of kilometers down the coast. And likewise, what we also see is that in many places, infrastructures, while well intended, don't really work because they're too single-sided. And you can see that in the second picture, you can build a strong seawall such as this one in the city of Jakarta that protects against sea level rise. But if you don't take into account that there might be also issues at play such as uh, subsidence of soils, actually you create through your infrastructure a very dangerous situation because you create a sinking city that is protected by a very narrow concrete sea dike. And lastly, there's of course many problems often appearing when infrastructure is uh, applied in sensitive environments where ecosystem degradation might be a big problem. Next slide, please. So I think some of these uh, challenges force ourselves to ask the question, sh shouldn't we change the way in which we are implementing our infrastructure? Shouldn't we turn away from an approach that is about fighting nature or building in nature towards an approach where we work with and alongside nature. Next slide, please. And such an integrated approach requires us to move away from a very technocratic way of applying infrastructure in a specific site towards adopting a much more integral approach where you really, as a starting point to your work, try to understand the functioning of your wider system. So this is about understanding how coastal ecosystems, for example, can protect coastlines and can contribute to coastal safety, understanding ecological conditions. But it's also <coughs> about understanding the behavior of longshore currents along the shore, the, the sediment uh, supplies that are brought in by the river, the demography, the governance, the perspectives of the local communities, and bringing that all together into one approach, understanding that wider system, that is what building with nature is about. Next slide, uh, please. So building with nature is more a design philosophy than that it prescribes a specific design solution. And you can see that on this slide, building with nature can be anything between solutions that are more on the soft side all the way towards the hard side, which means that if you have a lot of space, you can in a building with nature solution, keep a lot of space for nature to provide, for example, coastal protection. Whereas maybe in urban environments, the focus is on applying hard structures, but still there might be space actually to apply nature-based solutions. And there are some examples included in the pictures here. So you can work with sand uh, solutions where you create sand islands in front of the coast uh, that provide uh, coastal protection. You can create forests in front of sea dikes, such as mangroves, for example, uh, that provide coastal protection, as well as, for example, oyster reefs. And these kind of different solutions, you can think of many different ones, they can be applied both in temperate as well as in tropical uh, conditions. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, I think everyone knows the Netherlands. Uh, next slide, please, sorry. I think everyone knows the Netherlands, the country where I am from, as a country uh, that has become famous of fighting the sea with very big infrastructures. We have big dikes along the coast that protect us, and we have canalized our rivers to keep the floodwaters uh, at, at bay. And here you can see a picture of one of such dikes in the north of the country, a very big sea dike 
that keeps tens of thousands of people safe against flooding. But in recent years, we, uh, we have been in, in quite big trouble because sea level rise has caused this dike no longer to be safe. The seas come too high up, and when there is a storm, there is a serious risk of overtopping uh, with very big risks, potentially. So there was a question, what can we do to make this dike safer? And initially, people said, well, we need to pour more concrete, we need to make it higher. But then there were discussions about different approaches. And this is actually an example where the Netherlands, for one of the first time, applied the building with nature approach as an alternative to spending a lot of money on hard infrastructure. Next slide, please. This is the result two years later. Rather than pouring much more concrete on the dike, we created a very diverse dynamic environment in front of the dike. So we built uh, a sandy foreshore, a beach with sand dunes and lagoons. And this has created a lot of safety, while the solution was uh, much cheaper. And of course, it's for tourists that visit this place much more attractive to visit this system as opposed just to walking on a big concrete dike. Next slide, please. We did something uh, similar in our rivers. For centuries, we have canalized our rivers, we have uh, digged them deeper, we have built big dikes. And while that has kept, uh, kept us safe for a while, again, due to climate change, there's increasing flooding risks as the rainfall patterns are, are changing. And well, the decision makers in the Netherlands, they decided that building ever higher dikes was no longer a solution. It was too expensive, it was too risky, and it didn't really improve the quality of living in our river areas. So instead of building a dike, they decided to again apply a building with nature solution. And you can see that on the next slide. What they did was that they actually brought back a lot of the former ecosystems along the river that had been converted in the last centuries. So they uh, created parallel side channels in the rivers, they recreated floodplains, and they, those floodplains play an important role in regulating flood flows. Uh, so therefore, as a result of these measures, uh, the flooding risks have gone down substantially. And due to the positive experiences gained with these and other projects, slowly this approach of doing engineering is becoming mainstream in the Netherlands. In the last few years, we have uh, spent in extent of 3 billion euros applying these kind of nature-based building with nature solutions. And Wetlands International has been following these efforts for many years. And we are working hard now to also introduce this approach together with our partners in a number of tropical countries. And I would like to proceed this presentation sharing you some examples of this approach in uh, the tropics. Next slide, please. So for example, this is an approach where uh, we were not directly engaged, but it is in tropical Florida. It's a project where uh, they applied uh, a mangrove solution in uh, an uh, in a, a harbor area. So there was a big need to establish uh, a terminal for, uh, for big ships, and they decided actually to create within that harbor area a mangrove system, again to make sure that environmental impacts of the harbor development were mitigated, and also to improve the, uh, the quality of the water and the wider environment in the area. Next slide, please. And Wetlands International a few years uh, ago became quite uh, concerned about this coastal area in the city of Samarang in Java, which has been suffering a lot of erosion. The area has lost more than two kilometers of coastline, the sea retreating two kilometers land inwards as a result of large scale uh, degradation of the mangrove forests and soil subsidence caused by massive groundwater extraction. Next slide, please. So they tried to build dikes in this system, um, but that didn't really work because the mud was too soft and the dikes would simply sink in the mud. And meanwhile, the erosion continued and continued, and already thousands of people in this area had lost their, uh, their villages and their livelihoods. So uh, together with the Indonesian government authorities, we thought it might be an option to actually apply a nature-based solution in this area. So what we did first, if you could give one click in the animation, was to create um, what we call permeable dams. So grids of brushwood that actually capture the power of the waves and when the tides come in, let the sediments that are dissoluted in the, in the water settle in front of the eroding coastline. One more click. 
And you can see that on this picture. So after about a year, uh, through this approach with the permeable dams, we are able to really restore the eroding uh, foreshore and bring sediments back. Once that happens, and you can see that on the next click, the restored sediment foreshore allows settlement of mangroves in front of the eroding coastline. And what we've essentially done is we applied some engineering solutions to restore the sediment balance with allowing space for nature to come back and for mangroves to kind of fortify the foreshore. Next click. And then what we also did was that we, in the hinterland, worked with local community groups to support sustainable aquaculture development and support the development of a mangrove-based economy. And that has increased the income of local communities with more than 300%. So I think this is a very nice example of how we combine engineering with environmental restoration and sustainable land use in order to uh, restore this coastline. Next slide, please. We've worked with local communities, with the governments, and with engineering firms for many years, and are now slowly implementing these kind of measures amongst the entire 20 kilometers eroding coastline, really to fortify the eroding coast. Next slide. And we're now also working with the city of Samarang to actually bring this approach further to scale. Uh, so we have developed with a number of city planners an urban master plan, where we try to accommodate the need for urban growth in Samarang with measures that bring nature-based solutions in the city and that restore the high value coastal areas that are further out of town. And you can see that on this infographic. So we apply an approach where we use natural wetlands to reduce flooding risks, use the water retention function of those wetlands, and where in front of the coastline, we uh, apply the permeable dams and mangrove solutions to create a very firm mangrove buffer that together with hard infrastructures provides uh, protection to the city and that allows climate change to be kind of mitigated um, as climate change appears. Then I would like on the next slide to take you to the other part of the continent. Um, on the left, you see a, a picture of the city of Panama City in Panama. It's a, a city that lies in a, a low lying coastal area with a lot of mangroves and there's a lot of rapid growth. And the people in Panama City made quite a big mistake because to accommodate the growth of the city, they created all kinds of urban and industrial areas in the floodplains of the river. They uh, performed landfills and built infrastructure there. And as a result of that, the water regulation role of the floodplains disappeared. As a result of that, now every year, 20,000 people experience severe flooding because uh, the wetlands do no longer keep the floods at bay. And this is, of course, a big problem. And in response to this problem, we have started working uh, with the government authorities, uh, amongst others, the majors of us, uh, to develop a master plan to address flood risk reduction. The essence of this master plan is that, on one hand, we want to use hard infrastructures to reduce the flooding problems, but at the same time, we want to restore the flood protection values of the coastal wetlands that were lost. And that essentially means two things. It means that the vital environments that are still in place, the mangroves further to the seaside, that they are conserved. And we are also uh, reducing uh, the flooding risks by restoring some of the wetlands further inland that have disappeared a few years ago. And recently, the Inter-American Development Bank issued a 100 million euro loan to actually implement this project. And I think this case is quite interesting because it has a lot of similarities with some of the needs and the challenges that are also visible in uh, Manila. So I think there's a lot we can learn from this case. Next slide, please. Um, so maybe you can click the different animation uh, sheen. Uh, we started this approach really to bring people together uh, to explore this approach with us. And then in the last years, uh, with a public-private partnership in the Netherlands and in several other countries, we started developing many other pilot projects in different parts of the world to show how this building with nature approach can make a difference for nature and people. I think it's now that we are uh, reaching the next stage. Now uh, we are trying to create skill for this approach and ensure uptake by the market. Um, there's much more to say about this building with nature approach and there will be many uh, resources you can check online. Uh, but I think you will see that we have established a firm evidence base to show that this approach can at low cost uh, serve the needs of local people, the economy and of nature. 
And that's why we really want to work hard to ensure uptake by the market of this approach. And for that, we, we, we need you. We need your local expertise and your local interest. And next uh, slide, uh, please, Sashin, uh, to make this happen. Um, so yeah, this is to invite you really to explore this approach with us. And I would be very keen to hear from you uh, what we can do in the Philippines uh, to explore this approach uh, further. Uh, we have started an initiative which is called Accelerating Adaptation to Building with Nature in Southeast Asia, where we want to bring different countries together to test and upscale this approach across the Asian continent. And uh, yeah, I would be very keen to hear back from you what opportunities from your respective backgrounds you see to apply this approach at scale. Well, there's much more to tell, uh, but I think I leave it at that for now. Hopefully this has provided you with an interesting short introduction of the Building with Nature approach. Uh, Sheen, I want to let you know that I have managed to change my planning, uh, so I will be able to attend this event uh, for the full uh, one and a half hours. So if you like, we can also keep the question and answers uh, till the end of the uh, event and uh, join it up with the other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Okay, um, I've mentioned earlier uh, that Peter uh, will only op uh, will only uh, entertain the questions after his talk, but uh, we will now move it on the open forum because he will stay with us. So for our next uh, talk, just for a while. Our next speaker, um, she will be giving us a talk on building with nature in Asia, Philippines for disaster risk reduction. After her talk, she will share to us the beautiful video on Birds of the Yellow Sea, a film produced by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in New York, USA. Our speaker is Dr. Anadel Cabanban, and she is the country representative and program manager of Wetlands International Philippines. She is trained marine biologist in the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and the James Cook University in Australia. She used to be part of an academic institution in the Philippines and Malaysia. She has worked parallel to her academic duties in environmental projects funded by bilateral and multilateral entities in the country and in Southeast Asia. Her passion is, in make, is making science relevant to society by linking science, policy, and practice. Right now, she is leading activities towards increasing investment for integrated risk management towards the resiliency of marginalized community. She is currently a member of the technical working group of the Manila Bay Sustainable Development Master Plan. It is a pleasure to present to you Dr. Anadel Cabanban. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this webinar. Can you hear me, Sheen? Yes, I can hear you, ma'am. Sorry, I'm just, uh, I'll share your presentation. Yeah. So I'll present to you uh, the application of building with nature for disaster risk reduction. The Philippines is a signatory of the Sunday framework for disaster risk reduction, and we are contrib contributing to its targets. Next slide, please. Peter gave us a challenge in his talk. What can we do to accelerate building with nature in the Philippines. So these are the questions 
how can we help transform the sector? How can we promote building with nature in the Philippines? And how can we work together and innovate? In the succeeding slides, I will present to you how we are working together in the Philippines to apply building with nature in the project sites that we are working in. Next slide, please. Building with nature in the Philippines as an approach is an imperative. We are surrounded by water. We have three major island groups, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, and thousands of islands. So we need to have uh, an approach that is uh, sustainable along the coastline. We have 18 major river basins and many more whose watersheds are disturbed or damaged and the drainage basins as well are disturbed. So there's threat to flooding. And we are adjacent to the Pacific Ocean where typhoons brew every year. There's about 20 typhoons that pass through the Philippines, either directly hitting the country or not. Nonetheless, it's it's bringing lots of rain to our country. Next slide, please. The World uh, Risk Index for the Philippines in 2019 ranks the Philippines as number one. In uh, 2016, or it was uh, we were number three. Now we're already number one, ahead of all the main countries around us. The World risk index is uh, calculated as the exposure times the vulnerability. Exposure is the number of population in the country that is exposed to, to the nature uh, events, this stream events. The vulnerability is also a function. You can see the, uh, the formula there at the bottom of the screen and uh, the link to the document that you can read more about it. So it's necessary for us, for the Philippines, to act in order for disaster not to, to hit us. Thank you. Next. Building with nature can be applied in two ecological systems, even three systems in the Philippines, but today I'm just going to present two. One is on the river basin and one in the coastal ecosystems. You can see here on the picture, uh, the photos I've taken from the air on the Tacloban coastline, the river uh, that drains into the, Cat the Tacloban Bay. Next slide, please. In, for uh, the river basin, we have applied uh, bioengineering to reduce the risk to hazards. The hazards are landslides, uh, erosion on river banks, and the landslides on uh, both the slopes as well as on the river banks. So uh, we're doing replanting of native trees as well as fruit trees in a strategic manner. You can see here in the photos that from the left, the erosion on the river bank and uh, the replanting that we have done with small trees here on the middle of photo. And the strategic way that we are planting the tropical trees and crops on a slope on the far right photo. This is what's called uh, a bioengineering and strategic planting or agroforestry. Next slide, please. We also are implementing activities in the Kagayan Oro River Basin in Mindanao. The hazard is uh, flooding in the delta in Cagayan de Oro City, which is uh, a major city in Mindanao. And we're doing this with rainforestation. This is the approach taken by the Mount, um, the Hineleven Foundation, which is a combination of uh, these activities. They mimic the natural colonization by having a tree that shades the cogon grass, and uh, then once the cogon grass is dead, then they replant with uh, native trees and uh, cacao for livelihood. 
We also work with the uh, local stakeholders, the indigenous people, the LUMADs, and uh, we uh, work with them by building uh, green um, livelihoods such as cacao or coffee at different levels, different species, and uh, having a communal garden to provide the food for uh, crisis. And uh, we're working with the Cagayan de Or River Basin Management Council for payment for ecosystem services that will fund the rain, rain forestation efforts. And uh, we're developing a hydrological model and decision support tool in order to find where the critical sites within the river basin to replant. So this is a real uh, action on the ground that is ongoing and we're working with partners under the Risto Coast Rain to Top project. And you can see the partners at the bottom of the screen. Next slide, please. So this uh, um, activity in Tacloban and Palo has been conducted uh, in the past uh, five or so years. It uh, produced the coastal zone protection strategy. The hazard, as you remember, was uh, storm surge, uh, the, biggest in the, the biggest in the country. This has happened. And uh, uh, there are extreme events that also happen every now and then associated with typhoons. The coastal zone protection strategy includes a 100 meter belt, green belt, this is made of NIPA uh, and, uh, and, um, and mangroves. This has to be replanted in order to protect the urban areas in the coastline. The restoration of uh, underproductive and underutilized fish farms is also undertaken. The photo here on the slide is a fish pond that is uh, being replanted and now mangrove trees have grown. Next slide please. Next slide please. So with this uh, um, approach we think, uh, can you go back please uh, to the, yeah, Another coastline that we are working in is in the northern part of uh, Manila Bay, the north coast. Uh, people will remember that there is uh, flooding, there constant flooding, tidal flooding, and this tidal flooding is exacerbated with storms and uh, typhoons. And uh, so in preparation for the, the planning to be implemented in the north coast of Manila Bay, Wetlands International Philippines conducted a series of seminars. And you can see here a photo of Arna giving a talk on building with nature and its applications in uh, the north coast of uh, Manila Bay. And the audience there, the, the representatives of the local uh, government units, the engineers, the planners, and environmentalists, the central members, and in addition to the lectures, we take them also, we have taken them also to the field to really see what the issues are. And uh, next slide, please. The, this slide shows uh, the, the red parts are the areas that's going to be populated. And uh, you can see all, you can barely see, I think the line uh, below the, the red areas. The, the lines here are the line here below the, the blotches of red is uh, the area that is flooded. It's uh, subsiding. It's subsiding due to over extraction of uh, water and uh, Experts believe that uh, this area should not be uh, populated anymore in the next uh, uh, 20 years. If, uh, right now, if it's going to be populated, it will be, the people will be in danger of uh, flooding. This, the experts believe that this area need to be 
uh, restored. And um, next slide, please. These are these areas below 1.5 meters, and with sea level rise, the area in 20, 20 years will be underwater. And uh, to have a very hard infrastructure to to put in place would be very expensive and would be um, maybe useless as what we have found also in uh, in Samarang because this part here is uh, made of muddy soil and soft. So it's proposed that this area be protected using building with nature approach where it will be a combination of earthen dikes, restoration of mangrove forests, mangrove forests that have been converted to fish ponds so that we can restore the, the hydro, the water flow, the, um, the protection function of the mangrove forest there. And uh, the, the people behind the yellow line there will be protected. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So what can we do? The Wetlands International Office has, has joined the countries uh, like China, India, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Wetlands International has offices there too in this uh, project this building in with nature in asia initiative where we're undertaking um training session so that everyone will um will uh, be more um will be more attracted to this approach so individuals how can you help in this building with nature approach. You can help transform the sector if you're a civil engineer, uh, a policy maker, um, an environmentalist, you can help transform the, the sector by introducing the building with nature approach. If you're a stakeholder, you can promote the more sustainable and inclusive approaches like bioengineering, uh, uh, reef, room for the river approaches, giving the river room for inundation, uh, build, using uh, mangroves for keeping the, the soil uh, and river and uh, coastline intact. We can also propose uh, nature type solutions in your work. You can also work with us to learn and innovate uh, new approaches in civil infrastructure. Next slide, please. For more information, as we know, we are just breezing through this uh, approach. You can see or visit the website of our organization and also EchoShape, where you can see more uh, examples of the application of the building with nature in tropical situations. Next slide, please. I want to thank uh, the, the use of the slides 10 and 11. This is an output of the National Economic Development Authority in the Manila Bay Sustainable Development Master Plan. This is still a draft. This will have to be uh, uh, scrutinized, uh, studied by our stakeholders. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. So now um, I would like to invite you to an intermission. This uh, intermission is a video of uh, the East Asian Flyway. This uh, video was prepared by a cinematographer and a photographer from Cornell University. Uh, this uh, video will also set the scene on for the next talk, which is the building with nature for people and nature. Can you please roll this uh, video? Thank you.
My name is Garrett Venn, and I'm a cinematographer and photographer for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Much of my work over the last 10 years or so has focused on shorebirds. To film or photograph or record these birds, you really need to know their natural history and their, their life cycle because they're at different places doing different things at very specific times of the year. One of the most interesting parts of their life cycle is spent in the far north in the Arctic and subarctic on the breeding grounds where they become these very independent territorial birds and they pair up very quickly to take advantage of the brief Arctic summer to raise the next generation. The rest of the year they are in these wheeling social flocks traveling the globe on long distance migrations. But for a brief time each year their, their plumage becomes more beautiful. They have these amazing vocalizations and courtship displays. And they work together as pairs for the purpose of raising their young. Among all these different shorebird species, there's one species, the spoonbilled sandpiper, that everyone who is fascinated by shorebirds wants to see. Historically, it's been one of the hardest shorebirds to find. They breed in remote areas in Chukotka in the Russian Far East, and winter in isolated places scattered throughout Southeast Asia. In recent years, it became very clear that populations of this species were drastically declining. 30 years ago, there were thousands of spoonbilled sandpipers. Today, there's only a few hundred of them left. Several years ago, I was sent to film this bird on the breeding grounds. And I spent several months of the summer up there following these individuals as they courted and nested. While I was in Russia, I also had the chance to film nesting red knots. They are beautiful russet shorebirds, larger than a spoon-built sandpiper. And they are extremely well camouflaged, and they rely on this camouflage to remain undetected during the period when they are sitting on the nest. So they are very hard to find. The song of the male red knot displaying over the tundra is one of the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard in the far north. The champion of all these long distance migrants is the bar-tailed godwit, particularly populations of bar-tailed godwits that nest in Alaska. I filmed them on the breeding grounds on the Yukon Delta. Both the male and female godwit incubate the eggs roughly on 12 hour shifts. I watched a female walk in towards a male cautiously after flying in from a distance and very gently with this long beak. She brushed the feathers on his back, letting him know it was time for him to get up and for her to get on the nest. When you're witnessing something like this, it's hard not to deeply feel for these birds as individuals. When you see this commitment to their nest and to their young, you develop a strong caring for these birds and an even deeper fascination for the things that they're able to do. Shorebird chicks hatch, they are able to feed on their own immediately. They are never fed by their parents. At birth, they have really well-developed legs and feet and beaks. The most important things for them when it comes to moving around, staying safe and feeding. And they grow very rapidly. One of the most fascinating things about these shorebird chicks is that they're not led south by their parents. As soon as the eggs hatch or shortly thereafter, the female migrates south, leaving the male to care for and lead the chicks for several weeks before he also departs and heads south. Once these tiny birds fly and they've put on some fat, they will head south on their own. Unlike some other bird species, shorebird migration routes are innate. They aren't learned from their parents or from other birds. 
They are etched into their DNA through tens of thousands of years of evolution. Long-distance migrant shorebirds like these from across eastern Russia and parts of Alaska migrate south, many of them for vast distances, to winter in the southern hemisphere or tropics to what is collectively known as the East Asian Australasian Flyway, a route that several million birds use in the fall and then again on their return trip north in the spring because it has such reliable areas for feeding along the way. Most of the individuals for many of these species go through the Yellow Sea, and for many of them, it is their only stop on their northward or southward migration. 36 species of shorebirds in all use the wetlands and intertidal mudflats around the Yellow Sea during parts of their migration. The sea is bounded by the Koreas to one side and China to the other side, and its vast intertidal mudflats are extremely productive for marine life. Each year during spring and fall, there are locations where you can see tens of thousands of these shorebirds congregating in predictable areas where food is abundant year after year. There is one place on Earth where you have a great chance of seeing a spoon-billed sandpiper, even though there are only a few hundred left today, and that's the Rudong Mud Flats in China, 5,000 kilometers from the nest that I filmed in Russia. I went there in the fall as the birds were moving through during the time of the year where they are fattening up. And I was lucky enough to find several individuals that I was able to film. The most unique thing about a spoon-billed sandpiper is its spoon-shaped bill. It primarily forages in the soupiest of mud where its flattened bill passes easily from side to side. And it uses its bill tactily to locate food items in the mud. The beak is packed with sensory receptors that help it quickly locate large prey items like small shrimp and crabs that aren't typically a major part of the diet of other shorebirds at size. Many of these shorebird species are specifically evolved to take advantage of certain types of prey that are seasonally or locally abundant and you can see the specialization just by looking at their unique beaks. It's easy to look out at mudflats and think they are all the same and they all contain the same types of organisms. But like any shell fisherman knows, you go to the places where you have the best chance of finding the most food in the shortest amount of time. The coarseness and types of sediment, the salinity, the currents, the available nutrients all play a role in determining the abundance and types of organisms found in the mud. And for the spoonbilled sandpiper, the Rudong mudflats, fed by sediments from the Yangtze River, create the best conditions for the type of organisms they specialize in catching. For certain populations of red knots that migrate from the Russian Arctic Unique conditions on the mudflats at Bohai Bay produce the type of food that they specialize in. The red knot's beak is kind of a mid-length beak. They're not probing very deep into the mud or skimming things from the surface, but feeling just an inch or so into the mudflat to the depth where small bivalves congregate. And they have an, a large gizzard that they use to crush shells very efficiently and process them. In the areas favored by spoon-billed sandpipers, these high densities of small bivalves don't exist, so the red knots don't go there. The bar-tailed godwit makes one of the most impressive migratory flights of any bird. They depart Alaska in the fall and make a seven, eight, nine day nonstop flight over the open Pacific Ocean to New Zealand. What many people don't know about their migration is that on the way back, 
virtually the entire Alaska population stops at a small area of the Yellow Sea coast at a place called Yalujang. They'll spend up to a month there, fattening up again, before taking off to make another non-stop flight back to Alaska to breed. At Yalujang, you can see huge flocks, tens of thousands of these godwits, in the spring as they're moving north. The soft, rich sediments there produce an abundance of deep burrowing marine worms and large shellfish, and a substrate good for probing. Watching a bar-tailed godwit forage with its incredibly long beak, digging very deep into the mud to the point where its head is even getting buried, it's amazing to watch how efficient they are at locating these food items at some of these locations. They're able to locate and swallow many, many prey items in a short amount of time. In order to efficiently put on fat and in order to complete their migrations, these birds are relying on mudflats with dense food concentrations. Tens of thousands of years of evolution have determined that this place at Yalujang is the place where they can find the most food in the shortest amount of time. And for the other 36 species of shorebirds that rely on intertidal mudflats and wetlands of the Yellow Sea, it's clear that it's not the vast intertidal areas of the Yellow Sea that are critical to bird life, but it's these very productive areas within the Yellow Sea that these birds are genetically programmed to go to that are critical to their survival. The Yellow Sea is quite literally the hub of this entire flyway. It is the location that many of these bird species and populations of birds depend on to complete their migrations to their wintering areas and then back to their breeding areas. Without this critical location, none of this would be possible. These migrants from Alaska, from much of Russia, Australia, New Zealand, Myanmar, Southeast Asia, they all depend on the Yellow Sea's enormously productive intertidal mudflats. Thank you so much, Dr. Anadel, for the fruitful knowledge on building with nature in Asia, plus the wonderful video. Before we proceed to our next speaker, I would like to remind everyone to answer the, to answer the evaluation poll at the end of the webinar. Only those who answer the evaluation will receive a certificate of participation. For participants who are not able to register at Zoom meeting, but are viewing an FB live stream, you may request the evaluation poll and submit to wetlandsph at gmail.com and look for Ms. Riza Estadola. And now for our third speaker, he will give a talk on building with nature for water birds and other migratory species as part of habitat restoration and disaster risk reduction. He is a senior ecologist at the Nordic Agency for Ecology and Development in Copenhagen, an associate expert of Wetlands International. He has worked in most Asian countries, ASEAN countries rather, China and North Korea in projects including participatory management and monitoring of biodiversity and natural resources, identification of protected areas and water bird monitoring. In the Philippines, he has assisted the DNR directly or through the World Bank and the Global Environment Facility or GEF. He also assisted communities and local governments in disaster risk reduction planning and projects, and also in developing the coastal protection strategy for Tacloban and the sustainable development master plan for Manila Bay. He is one of the co-founders of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. Please help me welcome Mr. Arne Jensen. Good afternoon. Um, and 
very much welcome to our webinar. I am Arne Gensen and I will focus my presentation uh, as Sheen said on habitat restoration seen from the perspective of our migratory birds but also the coastal communities as water birds and communities often share the same needs when it comes to securing food and safe shelter. For those of you who saw this beautiful and very instructive video from the Yellow Sea that told us about the life cycle for many of the migratory water birds and their complete dependence on, on the intertidal flats. Let me just say, when we start these slides, I will just summarize them um, and focus a little bit more on what we technically think we can do in restoration of intertidal areas. Let me also say that when you looked at the video, many of the birds you looked at is as, as much as much Filipino birds as they are Russian birds or Australian birds. Um, so many of these birds actually may have been visiting your coastline, whether you live in Manila or you live in, in Mindanao areas or in Negros. Before that, let me share with you that the Philippines the last three years or so have taken some very important initiative in terms of policies promoting conservation and wise use of coastal areas, not least intertidal wetlands and associated habitats. I'm referring, for example, to the Ramsar, um, the Ramsar meeting COP13 in 2018. So we don't have time to go through in the details, but let me just share with you that restoration of the coastal wetland and all its uh, ecological functions is a focus of these policies that got suggested by the Philippines and approved by all the parties of conventions such as the uh, Ramsar Convention for International Important, uh, in, in international important uh, Wetland Sites and the Convention for Migratory Species. So we have now a situa situation where all the parties, I think, or the Ramsar, there are more than 150 countries, including the Philippines, uh, that is supposed fully to recognize the importance of the coastal wetlands for biodiversity, ecosystem services, and importantly, to stop further, further conversion of intertidal uh, flats, intertidal mud flats, stop, put a ban temporarily or permanently on reclamation in priority sites for biodiversity, irrespective irrespective of the current protection status. This is important because most of the Philippine important sites for water birds still has no protection status. Let me also share with you that in the meantime, after this video was made, that a country like China has now banned reclamation of intertidal flats and has designed new protected areas with World Heritage Site status. It covers about 11, sorry, 75,000 hectares in the Yellow Sea. And likewise, likewise, in huge areas in, uh, in the coastal wetlands important for migratory shorebirds in Myanmar is also being protected. Let's start, let's start the slides. Please proceed to the next slides. So we are now a little bit clear that my Migration means, in the case of the birds, and for many, many other species, land mammals, many pelatic species, even, for example, uh, important, <coughs> important fish species like sardines, that they travel from one place to another at regular times, often over very long distances. So for the birds, why on earth would you take all the risks to migrate? It is, in short, to take advantage of, in, of burgeoning numbers of foods in vertebrates, including, including, for example, insects that occur during the short summer in the north. And as you saw in the video, the abundance of nesting areas. And as winters approaches and availability of food drops because everything gets cold and frozen, the birds plows again and head for very specific wetland areas. Next slide, please. This is difficult to see, but roughly it says that um, the Philippines, together with 21 other countries, belongs to the East Asian Australasian Flyway. You can see it circled up there in the top 
What you cannot see is all the important dots. And each dot is more or less a result of the longest monitoring series, environmental monitoring series we had. That was initiated by Wetlands International. You know it here in Asia as the, as the uh, Asian waterfowl census that takes place uh, every year in January. And later on, it has been supplemented by the partnership of the East Asian Australasian uh, Climate Secretary that together with governments and NGOs and academia is making additional monitoring. This is very good for the first because it gives us an idea as an indicator how is it going with protection and management of wetlands. A wetland without water birds has a problem. A wetland with many water birds suggests that there is a very good ecosystem to be functioning. The, you saw in the video the flyway path with the Philippines in the middle, in the center of the flyway. Therefore, the Philippines and it is and its many, many uh, those smaller intertidal areas uh, plays an, an enormous role in safeguarding the life cycle of these migratory birds. They can simply not move from Alaska and down to Australia without having stop oversights where they can roost and they can feed. So what we see in the Philippines of border birds is other, they are on a stopover, may last a few weeks or months, refueling, getting fat so they can continue to hide, or they are in the overwintering areas. Let me share with you that some of the most important sites in the Philippines is um, covered on the sites of the Ramsar Convention. That does not mean that they are fully protected but at least morally are supposed to be protected. For these sites, let me mention them randomly, is the West Negros uh, wetland uh, and Ramsar site covering more than 50,000 hectares and uh, the tiny little Olanco Island and the, probably the last intertidal flats left in the Philippines, Sibugay Bay and Manila Bay, which probably look the same but still host in, in January, about 200,000 uh, water birds. Let me let go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, we have roughly about 50 species of water birds that are migratory. But importantly, if we want to steer management and protection, and recognizing that the coastline is not just one habitat, but several habitats, each supporting each other, like the coral reef, the coral reefs, the crest of the coral reef, the sandbars, the shell banks, the mud flats, the shallow seagrass areas. It is all together maintaining the life cycle, not only for migratory birds, but also for many coastal people. That is where they uh, find their food and humans and birds largely have the same reference for species. Unfortunately, the picture is a little bit blurred. So on top, you're supposed to see a lot of birds and below some of the things they eat, like shellfish, fishes, worms, a few examples. Next slide, please. So, what is the situation? Um, there are very, very big problems because of conversion of tidal flats. There's no law in the Philippines and in many other countries to protect by habitat. If you had a habitat protection law, you would not face this problem. So to give you an idea, populations in, uh, of migratory birds mirrors the decline in habitats and mirrors the decline in fishery of Manila Bay. Currently, of 18 international important populations of water birds, 11 are in decline, and that is the same as measured elsewhere in the flyway. The, the differentiation of the problems you can also see in the design of the peak, as you saw in the video. Some are very small, very small peaks and require one type of habitat. Another species, like the one up to the right, cup. The um, Bate Gottwit has a very, very long peak full of sensors where it can find 
delicious, nutritious worms, for example. The, during low tides, these are the feeding grounds for a number of migratory birds. You know some of them, shorebirds are these pictures, gulls, terns, egrets. But these are actually also the same area important for disaster risk reduction and the same areas important for local people's food security. Next slide, please. Here you see tidal flats are more than mud. These are merely shell banks. This is a picture from, uh, from the south coast of Bulacan. Next one. And to, and to look more in detail, you can see which are actually the globally endangered greater nuts. You also saw in the video. They are standing right on top of shell banks where they're eating various forms of small virals, including the honks. And in the background, you can see the interaction by the natural mud flats and shell banks together with natural mangroves. These are Avicinia mangroves. Uh, you can see the root network, which is keeping some of the tidal areas in place. Um, what is little, little known is that the densities are different. The birds do not randomly arrive to a site. Migratory water birds do not have a map. It is genetically encoded where they're going. So we can see from, from science results and research that they are conservatively moving to the same spots year in and year out. And these guys can live many years. That means that, for example, Manila Bay is 200,000 hectares, but it's not all of the 200,000 hectares that are equally important. I will show you a slide in a little while to illustrate what I mean. Again, using Manila Bay as an example, because we have Wetlands International together with IUCN Netherlands in collaboration with BMB of DNR and with using a lot of people science for many volunteers, bird watchers, experts, not necessarily from the academe, but experts by, by interest and knowledge, in, including from uh, Philippine NGOs, who are able to pull together this document. Can you see it? Which says international important water bird sites in Manila Bay, Philippines. And this documents why, for example, Manila Bay is a key biodiversity area and an important bird area, because it already has an international recognition of being extremely important. Next slide, please. So this murky picture, let me, let me walk through, let me walk through with it to you. <clears throat> this is, again, the northern part of Manila Bay. And the yellow spot you see is where the foot is, because that is where the birds are. The bigger the yellow circle, the more birds. The biggest one represents about 30,000 30, uh, birds. These are identified Ala, over two years. It's a mix of data from the Asian Waterfowl Census and helicopter research, boat research, overland research. So if you take, for example, one of the big yellow cir circles up to the left, that is from, uh, from the Lubao area, where we from the helicopter could roughly find about 25,000 uh, white egret species. Where other, other of the coastal spots directly mirrors the distribution of sandbars of remaining mudflats. And the red color you see is data from BIFA which shows congregations of spawning areas and uh, nursing sites, for example, for sardines, which, you know, makes up a substantial proportion of the fish catch across the Philippines and consequently are one of the most accessible and important source of animal proteins for millions of Filipinos. So we see here the linkage between the habitats. Unfortunately, Again, I'm using Manila Bay as an example. We could also have taken from Dawao or, or elsewhere. 
but let me continue in Manila Bay as an example. Over the past 40 years, we have lost about 80% of 44,000 hectares of the tidal flats. We had at least 5,000, and now we're down to a little over 1,000 hectares, at least before the development of the new airport. So this loss has massive ecological and biodiversity conservation consequences. And we, we can see uh, that the tidal flats plays an enormous important role for the life cycle of migratory water birds and also the adjacent the shallow waters for the cycle of fish species such as your migratory sardines. Next please. Where the food is, is also where people are. Very often it is kind of neglected that a large proportion of coastal people, many still living under the poverty line, is totally dependent on what we call gleaning fisheries. Collection of, collection of different kinds of, of, of seafoods, as you call it, ranging from crabs, sea urchins, uh, sea cucumbers sometimes, and uh, a lot of different species of sea snails and uh, bivalves. These pictures are, the pictures to the top right is from, uh, is from the Visayas area. And you will, if it was less blurred, you could see a lot, especially of women and, uh, and younger children being the ones uh, collecting this, uh, this uh, important food source. So you meet the community where they glean for invertebrates and they can tell you where they are the most. This is often the same areas where you find the largest congregation of migratory water birds. Each species have different food and habitat requirements, and that you already could see in the pictures of, um, of the water birds, the shorebirds. And each, each family, of course, also have from health problems, different needs for high nutritious food, and seafood is very nutritious. Therefore, for example, if you visit one of your country's uh, Ramsar sites, like the bird sanctuary in Ulango, you will see thousands of birds, but you will also see a lot of hungry people that every morning is going out in the very same tidal flats together with the birds to collect their daily needs. Next, please. So, this slides roughly, but I admit I have very limited time, sorry for rushing, highlights four major problems in many countries, including the Philippines. One is reclamation of intertidal areas. The top picture also shows, this is from North Manila Bay, that fish farm conversion of tidal flats and shallow waters has continued way beyond the shoreline. They are in many, many areas way out in the bay. You can see the dark gray is, is sediment loads coming out of a river. And as we speak, normally because there's no policies regulating, regulating fish ponds expansion or fish pond conversion, um, the fish ponds will expand further out on the mud flat. Or if not, there is a tendency, it's a long story, I have to mention it, there's a tendency that is easier to plant on tidal flats when you want to do something good mangrove planting. It's actually afforestation instead of restoration. You are converting one habitat into another. But this has consequences. If you look at the lower picture to the left, you see a mud flat which currently has been planted with single mangroves or mangrove propagules. And over time, this will grow up as a dense barrier wall to the right, lower right, shows one of these uh, mangrove reforestation projects on intertidal flats and therefore it is going to reduce the ability or the availability for migratory shorebirds as well for local people to do gleaning. The last problem, the last, the last problem is what I can call insufficient wetland management. You see wetlands, not least coastal wetlands, is one habitat that over time develops into something else. So if we have decided that we want to keep a wetland habitat, for example, with tidal flats, we need to manage these flats, otherwise they automatically will grow into, for example, a forest. An example, 
the Paranaque uh, coastal wetland of the Vitia, uh, the mangroves there on their own expand one per, a little under 1% per year. So 100 years, the 500 meters of mud flats automatically will become a dense mangrove forest. But wetland management is not really being experienced um, and as there's little experience on it, we have a tendency just to let the, let the wetland areas be. But this way, we are putting the objective of what it is we want to protect at risk. Next picture. Next picture, yes. Where, the, where are the people and where are the birds dependent on the tidal plants? So in planning of restoration and protection, if you look at the right map, it shows again um, North Manila Bay. We have made a red legend, and these are the focal areas where you find most different coastal habitats, including natural mangroves and tidal flats. Um, but this is also where you see the congregations of birds. Roughly, you can keep two-thirds of the migratory water birds in Manila Bay, around 165,000, if you protect 8,000 hectares of Manila Bay. So that is a little around, I think, about 5% of the bay. And there, that is where restoration and protection is out most important if you want to keep the diversity. Next, please. So among the good practices, we think is to keep shallow foreshore areas and tidal flats because it reduces the velocity of waves during storms and it also allows productive ecosystems and biodiversity to flourish. I call that the first line of defense. It is also a good practice that in land uses, before you do anything, that you have identified the most food productive and biodiversity rich areas, uh, for example, for gleaning fisheries for marginalized communities and for feeding areas for migratory birds. If you look to, into a typical comprehensive land use plan of any local government in the Philippines, it is very stringent in, in the fishery part, but when it comes to the biodiversity part and other zoning, it is kind of still missing. The third, the third one, for which you cannot see the whole text, that is what I call the third line of defense, is inland, inland earth dikes that are easy to maintain because they allow the intertidal system to flourish and, and uh, it can also involve people in the whole construction and maintenance of these earth dikes. Next please. So these I will just summarize the red, the, the red text what we have been discussing in the Manila Bay planning, but I think this can be used in many other places, that we need to rethink the way we want to execute disaster risk reduction and recognize that we need Mother Nature in, we need Mother Nature to help rather than to lend a bent arm with Mother Nature. So for example, restoration, because we don't have endless money, restoration of the two kilometer white foreshore shallow mud flats um, is a priority. And we have in the Philippines a very interesting, unique situation, namely there is a surplus of draining, dredging materials coming from the rivers, mostly because many of the rivers not anymore have room, room as it used to. It cannot anymore meander and deposit its, its, uh, its uh, sediments along, along the, uh, the river banks. So it moves straight out in the Manila Bay. So in many areas, the ongoing expensive dredging project and nobody knows where to put the dredging materials. But we also have a beginning sea level rise. We also have areas, as Ms. Anadel mentioned, where there is subsistence. And that's exactly where you need these dredging materials to be deposited. Then behind all of this, that is where the original mangrove were and that is where a, a, mite, a white mangrove belt would be very, very good both for, both for the local people and as part of disaster risk reductions. And again, the dike, we think it should be at least six meter high. 
and the areas in between. We, I will show you some pictures on how you, as a best practice, can use these areas. This will all require that dismantling of fish ponds is possible. For example, informal ponds, expired fish ponds lease agreements, and in combination with expropriation of other fish ponds, which is found in the most flood, flood risk areas of the coastline. Next, please. Let me take you through this one because uh, it's a little bit pixelated. So here we, we took an example from Bulacan, this one Payambon, and played around. And walk with me, go up to the white line. This is, for example, where you imaginary could put up your inland earth dike. You go down to the green line. The green line is areas where it currently is possible to put mangrove reforestation. But the yellow lines, the one in the middle, is for example where there is one of the last existing mud flats in Manila Bay. We only have about 1,000 hectares left. And this one is only about 60 hectares, but it represents within the area of the, of the blue line where you have most of the migratory birds congregating. It's a roughly about 20,000 water birds that are, that are dependent on that area. The red line, the red line is where you find mostly collapsed form of fish pond dikes made of stones, uh, concrete, but mostly of stones. And these forms a very, very important um, safety belts for the restoration, namely as breakwaters to hinder waves and other movements like currents to take away what you will deposit of sediments or what is already there. So in short, the green is mango re reforestation areas, the, the red is the breakwaters, the yellow is where you have or you can restore mudflats, and the white is our imaginary inland dike. And the blue is the key internationally important biodiversity area, one of the three in Bulacan. Next, please. But in the Philippines, tidal embankment and concrete seawalls is currently preferred. You see here a slide from the coastline of Tagloban, where we, together with a number of other NGOs and engineering firms, actually was advising to try to keep the coastline and build the nature. However, it was decided to build, and you see here you have a concrete, a concrete system, um, um, concrete system right up to the to the deep water. The problem with this tidal embankments and use of concrete is it's very very costly. It's very expensive. I calculated if you want to make a tidal embankment, for example, of Bataan and Bulacan, roughly 70 kilometers, that would, in, in money, similar to the budget from Tagloban, cost about 24 billion pesos. So, it is expensive, but it also has to be maintained because in many areas, uh, undersea currents and storms undermines the fundament where you put the concrete. So there's a big risk over time that your construction cracks and slowly tilts or falls apart. This is documented from many places. It disconnects the coastal intertidal areas once for all, for, for all, and tidal embankments reduces biodiversity, therefore it reduces food share security and livelihoods for local people. That is how I think nature would respond. Next, please. As my time is running out, let me just share with you a best practice which comes from our part of the world. It includes Netherlands in the bottom of the map, Germany in roughly in the middle and up in the top of the map, the little country Denmark. It has one of the largest zoned mudflat systems in the world. It is called the Wattensee. It's about 300,000 uh, World Heritage Site. And what makes it unique, and this is something because it works, that could be copied in many countries, including the Philippines. It has a zoning, a zoning that includes that development such as port and airports is put in one place, 
a fish take and a no fish take zone or muscle production zone is there to be implemented. And there is a huge zone also for migratory birds and marine mammals and our tourism areas. Roughly, if you roughly if you look at the map, you can see that the shallows is is along the left violet line. So anything to the left is deep water, but the shallows are left. You can also see green areas, which is roughly where you find some of the mudflats and the adjacent dark colors is also there. And what you cannot see is up in the north that where the, where the marker is right now, this is actually where the, the, uh, where the coastal dikes is. They are not out at the shoreline, they are deeply inland. Next, please. So here is just some small shots on what does it then look like when you stand in a area, a, a huge wetland area where you haven't put up tidal embankments. You see the whole foreshore is left for nature. On the left side you can see, but it's more than that. There is even water bodies behind and these water bodies can be used and are used both, as you see, to uh, to host hundreds of thousands of water birds. But importantly, during time, during time where we have where we have uh, storm surges and so on, and we have problems with floods, these white areas is actually also retention dams where other if you have a storm surge coming from the sea. You can open up and store water or you can close the dikes and the area serves as a retention dam for flood water coming from inland. Next please. So what is good for birds is good for people. That I think is clearly seen in many many areas. When I have been traveling around in East Asia including the Philippines I have known that I have seen the most smiles where people feel safe, where people have access to animal proteins, from, for example, for all the life forms in uh, the tidal areas, the intertidal flats. And it also makes people happy because they feel safe. I would like to, I would like to say that many areas today has been converted to privately owned lands or fish ponds. So one solution to protect, <clears throat> protect people and birds is a new way to do disaster risk reduction, a new way to protect nature and biodiversity. We need to see the local people and the LDUs and private landholders together to get the knowledge that each of them plays an important role. It is not just the foreshore area managed, managed in principle by, for example, BIFA, DNR, the LDUs, but it's also the many salt pans and the many fish ponds behind where these birds fly in during high tides. So there is a great positive challenge in thinking three in one, namely safety, food, and biodiversity. The presentation will now end with a tiny little homemade sequence, the only one we ever have, from a beautiful little wetland area. This is actually again here from the sun. Sorry people from Visayas and Mindanao. Um, but it just shows how beautiful uh, the nature is in a country like the Philippines. And it shows the interaction between mangroves, tidal flats, local folks and migratory birds. This is from Bulacan, from your coming international airport. It seems to have stopped, but maybe it will restart. So what you see is the original 
the original old mangrove forest. This is typically dominated by the white mangroves. This is called Avicennia. And if you can get the little video to run, it would also show you the interaction between a combination of typical uh, tidal mudflats and shell banks. It will also show you, maybe it will show us, it will also show you how local fisher folks are utilizing uh, some of these uh, very shallow waters. And first and foremost, it should show us a quite big congregation of migratory water birds, typically, typically uh, these are again flocks of greater nut that you saw in the video trying to get down to the shell banks and for those who had the opportunity to be with the regional DNR in January you would know that the area you see here this is not very big, it's about 400 hectares or so, hosts about 13,000 water birds. As the water birds are conservative, they will not just fly another place to try to find something to eat. They know this is the best place for them to be. And likewise, 100 kilometers from there, there is another intertidal system. And all these jigsaw puzzles together is knitting together the intertidal flyway system for about 5 million migratory uh, water birds, all in the East Asian, Austro-Asian flyway, for which the Philippines plays an enormous important role. So this is roughly where my presentation ends. Um, it has been a great pleasure for me to share some of my knowledge and I look forward to some good questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation, Arne. And now I would like to open the floor to questions. Uh, we have received uh, several questions, so without um, much ado, we'll proceed with the questions. So um, since we are running out of time, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to address the first question to Peter. Peter, can you hear me? Is it possible to restore a wetland? This is a question from Hanilin Onji. Is it possible to restore a wetland? Peter, can you hear? Yes, I can hear you. Is it possible to restore a wetland? Well, that's uh, quite a fundamental question. The answer is yes and no, I would say. I think sometimes we tend to think too easily that nature is replaceable and we think, okay, if a wetland is disappearing in one place, well, we can restore it in another place. And that is not the case because many wetlands have emerged and have grown and have established themselves over thousands of years and uh, people can never kind of completely mimic uh, the, the full diversity of a fully natural wetland. So my recommendation is that if there is in some place a high value wetland, you should at all time try to keep it intact as much as possible. But then of course, there are many places where we have already lost our wetlands, uh, where already many years ago, uh, we turned them into wastelands. And there with interventions, for example, following the building with nature approach, there is a lot that you can do to bring some fundamental wetland values back into your system. 
<coughs> and we have seen that in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a very heavily um, uh, utilized country and we've lost most of our pristine ecosystems. But with some efforts, you can actually bring nature back. So there was a, a Building with Nature project in the Netherlands where we just last week uh, got one bird back uh, who's breeding now in our country that was lost 60 years ago as a breeding bird to the Netherlands. So it shows that actually by restoring nature, you can bring a, a lot of values back into your system. Thank you, Peter. The next question is uh, somewhat related. What is the scientific approach in mangrove planting, not the usual mangrove planting along the coastal air area, which yielded very low growth rate? I can answer this very briefly. The uh, a scientific approach to uh, mangrove planting is using the restoration uh, principles. Uh, Wetlands International has come up with a document uh, to plant or not to plant. You can download this from the website. We have also prepared uh, a poster to make this uh, a lot more understandable to the general public. In essence, uh, you, you can plant uh, if there has been mangroves there in the past. You cannot plant in areas where there are no mangroves. You cannot plant where there are seagrass beds, or you cannot plant on seagrass beds. It will just kill the seagrass beds. Uh, you need to plant uh, in areas where it receives water, water from the sea, as well as water from the rivers, because uh, mangrove uh, species uh, thrive on estuarine areas. There are species, though, that thrive on very high saline water. This is the next point I would like to say. There are species that are suitable for uh, seaward locations. There are species that are suitable for landward locations. So it's not uh, an easy task. So I would suggest that uh, uh, you please download or you contact us and we send you the document for your reference. I just shared uh, the link to the publication in the chat box so everyone can access it there. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, for us newbies, uh, how is it possible for you, the speakers, to provide a menu of approaches for a certain situation for us to choose whatever is most economical and most applicable? So maybe Peter and then Arne. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are working with a, a partnership of universities and uh, NGOs and private sector engineering firms. And actually, uh, they are working now together to build such a manual for you. Um, Anadel already referred to EcoShape, which is the unit that coordinates this effort. And I think she also copied in her PowerPoint the link to the website. And on EcoShape, we are creating an online kind of knowledge platform where you will find a lot of information about all kinds of building with nature solutions. And one of the products that will be published in the coming three months is a book uh, on building with nature. And that does exactly what uh, the person that asked the question uh, asked for. It provides almost a menu card where depending on the context that you are working in, you can select what kind of building with nature solutions you can apply. And it distinguishes between coastal and freshwater environments, but for example, also between mud coast systems and coastlines that have a sandy coast, which all have different solutions. So I, will, uh, I would certainly recommend that you track what uh, resources there are already on the website of EcoShape uh, and for sure to get hold of a copy of the book because that will provide you a lot of information. And then lastly, if you go to the website of the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, there is also a very nice online atlas of building with nature uh, solutions available there. Uh, the only thing is they use a bit uh, of different terminology. So I think uh, they refer to nature-based solutions or working with nature. But if you Google it, uh, you should be able to find that publication also. Let me just add to what Peter said. In a Philippine setting and may, may, maybe other ASEAN countries, um, our challenge is, as the question was raised, how do we access knowledge, whether from the menu cards or manuals and books? And the second thing, which I think is very crucial in a Philippine setting at the least, 
namely how do we get the different departments responsible for example for flood mitigation and for for coastal uh, coastal management more interested in learning that requires a revisit of the curriculum at the universities so when we are saying flood mitigation that the menu that can be in new good books with a lot of knowledge is also a little bit of requirement for new generations of engineers so every time local people that's my experience for example from uh, from several of the cities i learned in local people has kind of given up they just refer to the different departments and if there is no driver to learn more alternatives including nature-based solutions as peter mentioned we are kind of trapped in a loop of lack of knowledge so these two things for me my experience goes hand in hand how do we get a change in the curriculum how do we get therefore the policy flows from the top to the bottom in the in, in the departments interested and driving that actually building the nature becomes equally recognized versus the more traditional engineer solutions the last question on my list is uh, how, for mpas where infrastructure is uh, not allowed hard infrastructure that is what is the best nature-based approach in mitigating increase in sea level? May I ask Peter to respond to this, please? Yeah, well, while the detailed answer of that would lie in the local conditions. So to answer that question, you would really need to understand the local system and what is exactly happening and what you can do within that system to counter sea level uh, rise. Um, what we do see in more general terms is that actually mangroves under certain circumstances, not always, can actually keep at bay sea level rise. And the reason for that is that mangroves play an important role in catching sediments and thereby laterally building up the soil. And of course, they also deposit a lot of organic materials like little leaves and branches that also uh, help building up the soil. And researchers have shown that under certain circumstances, particularly if there's a lot of sediment input from rivers, actually uh, mangroves can to a great extent grow along with sea level rise. So the general answer to provide to you is uh, to make sure that uh, you keep space for mangroves so, so that they can continue to play this buffer role or you bring mangroves back into your system. And I think another general recommendation is to be very careful not to promote uh, large-scale infrastructure development in intertidal areas because maybe now it looks safe but in the future, it might not be the case anymore. And this is actually one very expensive lesson that we have learned uh, in the Netherlands. A lot of our economy is actually concentrated in the lowest lying parts of the country. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, many of our assets are at risk from sea level rise. And we're spending a lot of money currently actually to keep us safe. While if we would have done some smarter planning 50 or 100 years ago, uh, yeah, we would have been able to to save tens of millions of uh, of euros of investment thank you peter that's a very, very important point we should learn lessons from the netherlands from your experiences now for the last question for today is a question for arne jensen yes um you said a while ago that one of the main drivers to decline of water birds is planting mangroves. What is your viewpoint on some organizations that practice planting mangroves to protect and sustain nearby low-lying communities against calamities? It's a very pointed question. Yes, it is. I will try to do, to do a very uh, specific answer. I tried to say during my presentation that what many areas are experiencing and where research shows that it may not be the best idea is we do the easy one. We do afforestation on tidal flats. But we shoo away from going back to the old mango line and trying to reforest, as Anadel said, where the mango was. This way, we we have not wisely thought about local people's need as i try to illustrate 
for daily uh, daily subsistence food because if you plant a, a very densely monocropping uh, outcrop in this case a single species mangrove as as dense as toothpicks people cannot enter this area anymore and it also creates in my view documented by by research work a false sense of safety do we plant on the intertidal flats because we need more safety if so we need 3.5 kilometer of new mangroves for sure just to reduce about 50 percent of the velocity of the waves in the philippines in general we do not have 3.5 kilometer of shallow areas so most areas you go to you can make 100 meters or you can make 200 meters and this is where you really have to reconsider your investments because there are billions of pesos available whether from the from uh, from international or local or government and ngos so by studying the research results for example when we looked at the impact or scientists looked at the impact in Haiyan um, that killed so many people in the corridor Samar, uh, corridor Leyte and in northern Cebu, we realized that the old mangroves, though they looked not so nice, after a few months recovered. But most of the planted mangroves, the single species mangroves, put in foreshore of where the mangrove was, they died. So apparently, that species that everybody would like to plant is not very sensitive to, to typhoons. So the lessons learned is we can save a lot of money to go back where we already have policies in place, for example, to reforest, to restore the old uh, abandoned fish ponds where the mangrove lines was. Also, for example, which is unique, maybe, to the Philippines, namely Manila Bay. It has a big, big problem in land subsidence because the many, many thousands of hectares of fish ponds, among other factors, have led to over extraction of water resources. So if you visit the coastline, you will see where the mangrove was. There is now 1.5 meters of water. So the attempts that has been done to plant there will not work. So if you add all the knowledge provided by the scientists, it is a very, very best practice to go back and try to reestablish the old mangrove forest line and shoo away from trying to plant where the mangroves probably cannot survive. Did that answer the question? So it is a, let me just add, it is the diversity of the intertidal system that gives all the benefits. It's not, it is not just to try to make intertidal systems, which are represented by several habitats, into just one habitat. It cannot work. Otherwise, the nature had made it only one habitat. Okay. Um, thank you, Peter, Arne, for answering the questions. I'd like to turn over now the floor to Sheen. Thank you so much speakers for accommodating the questions of our participants. I do hope we have plenty of time to entertain them all, but uh, we can do it uh, in our next or future webinars. For the pending questions, you may email it to wetlandsph at gmail.com and our speakers would be happy to answer you. I would like to call on our speakers to give us a wrap up of this, semin of this webinar, starting from Peter and followed by Dr. Anadol and Arne. Well, thanks to everyone. Um, I thought it was a very exciting uh, occasion to talk to you all and, and also to hear from the other speakers about what's happening in the Philippines. Um, I think what we've seen in this session is, well, the pressure is on, we're countered by climate change. Uh, we do need to develop our economies, but at the same time also keep a balance uh, with uh, the perspectives of local people who depend on local environmental resources. And of course, those beautiful birds that we saw in the video, we want to continue seeing them for the next few generations. 
so with that, I, I think what we've sketched in this session is an interesting potential pathway ahead. Uh, bringing back uh, together all these different perspectives and working with people from the local government, from the national government, with NGOs and, of course, the local people on de developing and designing future scenarios for developing our coastlines and river systems. Well, I would be very keen to think along with you and, uh, yeah, I hope to get the opportunity to visit your country once more in the near future and, uh, well, see uh, what is possible and see how between different countries, including my own, uh, we can continue to learn from each other and exchange experience. So once more, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I look forward to meet, meeting you in person, hopefully sometime uh, soon. Thank you. Thank you also. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to say that uh, this has been a, a very uh, good webinar. There is some feedback from our participants. And we are looking forward to building on what we have done in the last five and ten to ten years and uh, build more with our experiences with the global office and our neighbors here in Asia under the Building with Nature in Asia project initiative. Thank you very much. Arne? I would, I would say thank you very much. I understand that the the people who has been listening to us come from a white white part of the society different uh, different people different government agencies and i hope that we have inspired you with some of the uh, of the solutions and also with some of the the options that you have to visit more information it's it's difficult in a short time to express complicated matters but the complication of the matters is often in trying to pilot. We hope that we, together with LDUs and communities, can find some good areas where we can pilot more than we have done so far to show and showcase that um, building the nature is the solution, especially if we want also to consider food security and a scenario after the coronavirus where money will not be money will not perhaps be so easy available for the manila bay thing the master plan is not yet finished we uh, think that it needs perhaps a little bit more adjustments which is typical for all kind of plans but importantly that this kind of plans will be implemented as a collaboration between science government and ngos thank you so much it has been exciting to prepare and I hope that I will have opportunity to see and talk with some of the, of the uh, participants of which I know that somebody is kind of the frontliners in managing and protecting uh, the Philippine coastline. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arne. Thank you, Peter. We look forward to seeing you here in the Philippines. Thank you, Dr. Anadel. Thank you again, Arne. Okay, so um, that concludes our webinar. Thank you, everyone, and we appreciate you being here. For e-certificates, may we request the participants to please answer the evaluation poll after this reminder. For those who are not able to register at the Zoom meeting and are only viewing using the FB live stream, please type in your full name, affiliation, designation, and email address in the comment section. Request and submit the evaluation poll at wetlandsph at gmail.com. I will be flashing you. I will be flashing the. Uh, uh, reminders so you can see um, the email address okay so um, on behalf of the wetlands Philippi uh, wetlands international philippines i would like to thank you all again for joining us and we will see you ne next time keep safe everyone oh sorry uh, i'll open the poll questions muna and then uh, please try to answer